Welcome back to the Accessible Art History YouTube channel. This week, I'm continuing my AP Art History series with more required images from Unit 2. As I said in the last video, this unit is going to cover multiple videos because it spans thousands of years and multiple civilizations. This time around, I'm going to discuss half of the images from Ancient Egypt. There are nine required in AP Art History, so I'm going to divide them into two videos. So to learn more, keep on watching. The first required image of ancient Egypt is this item, the Palette of Narmer. It's incredibly important to the study of Egypt in its earliest days. This work dates from around 3000 to 2920 BCE. Narmer, whose name means painted catfish, is considered by historians to be the first pharaoh of Egypt because his military campaigns united Upper and Lower Egypt. The palette illustrates this important moment in history. It was discovered along with other sacred objects at an early temple of the falcon god Horus at the site of Hierakonopolis. This was the capital of Egypt at the time, which is another thing that signals its importance. This object would have been used as a makeup palette, where minerals would be crushed into pigments and then applied to the face and body. The palette itself is just over two feet long and made of siltstone. It is carved on both sides in low relief. On the front, we see a representation of the cow-headed goddess Hathor. She is one of Egypt's most powerful and oldest deities, with clear evidence of worship going back to the pre-dynastic era. The main part of the palette shows our hero, Narmer. Note that he is wearing an outfit associated with kingship of Upper Egypt. Not only is he stepping on his enemies, but he is about to club one to death. Notice how Narmer is distinctly bigger than his enemies. Art historians call this hierarchy of scale. Essentially, the bigger your figure is, the more important they are. To the right of Narmer, there is a large falcon. This is the god Horus, the same god whose temple the palette was found in. He is helping Narmer slay his enemies, showing that the campaigns were divinely sanctioned. On the other side of the palette, we see the aftermath of the battle. This time, Narmer is wearing the kingly costume of Lower Egypt. Once again, he is the biggest figure in the upper scene. He appears to be a part of a procession celebrating his victory. There is even a pile of bodies, their heads severed and placed between their legs. The center part of this side of the palette is where cosmetic mixing would have taken place. Two mythical creatures, called serapopods, intertwine their long necks to create a recess. Together, these two sides show how Narmer and his military might brought the two halves of Egypt together for the first time to create a mighty kingdom that would last for thousands of years. In many ways, this next required work is the opposite of the last one. It's called The Seated Scribe and dates from around 2500 BCE or the 4th Dynastic Period. As the name would suggest, the sculpture is of a man seated cross-legged. It's made of painted limestone with wood and rock crystal added for details. Amazingly, the majority of the paint has survived the millennium, given the piece a true lifelike quality. The eyes are particularly well made, which also give the scribe an air of intelligence and alertness. He almost seems as if he could stand up and start speaking at any moment. Aside from his lifelike features, there's another part of the sculpture that makes it remarkable. As I will discuss later in the video, portraiture ancient Egypt was almost always idealized. This means that people were shown in a certain way, specifically one that would represent their most perfect form. However, the seated scribe is not idealized. Instead of having lots of muscles, he's kind of chubby. The artist has emphasized his rounded stomach and slight paunch. This is fairly unusual, especially because the position of a scribe is usually reserved for members of the royal family. This makes the seated scribe even more lifelike. The next image on the AP Art History list is technically a set of images, but this makes sense as there are three pyramids and a giant sphinx on the Giza Plateau. This group of monuments dates from the Old Kingdom period, specifically around 2600 to 2500 BCE. The oldest pyramid is also the largest. It was built for the pharaoh Khufu around 2551 and 2528 BCE. Fascinatingly, it was the tallest man-made object in the world until 1221 CE, with the construction of Old St. Paul's Cathedral in England. The construction of the Great Pyramid is absolutely remarkable. In a time before computer-aided design and calculations, the ancient Egyptians managed to create a building that only differs by one and three quarters inches on each of its four sides. It is also level within less than one inch. How amazing is that? Khufu's Pyramid is built of about 230,000 blocks of stone. Some of them weigh up to 50 tons or 100,000 pounds each. Today, the pyramids are rough and brown, but back in their prime, the outside would have been encased in brilliant white limestone. The sides would have been smooth and polished, shining in the bright Egyptian sun. 
As many of you know, pyramids in general, not just on the Giza Plateau, were used as burial sites for royalty. Inside Khufu's pyramid, there are two chambers, one for the pharaoh and one for his queen. There would have been religious spaces and rooms for treasure and items to take into the afterlife. Additionally, outside of the pyramid, there were seven boat pits. Boats are symbolic as they ushered the pharaoh into the afterlife. These likely accompanied Khufu during his funeral procession and were buried alongside the king. The next pyramid, both chronologically and size-wise, is the Pyramid of Khufu's son Khafre. It was built between 2520 and 2494 BCE and actually appears larger because it was built higher on the plateau. The inside of Khafre's pyramid is also much simpler than his father's, which is a few chambers for the king and his goods. However, what makes Khafre's space so special is that we were left with dozens of images of the king, allowing us to analyze his likeness thousands of years later. In addition to the 52 statues of Khafre discovered in his pyramid, we also have his most famous statue, the Great Sphinx. It's outside of the pyramid. It sits at the end of a causeway running down the east side of the complex. It's a giant lion's body with the head of a pharaoh. Most Egyptologists do agree that this is Khafre's likeness. The mythical beast was carved into the bedrock and appears that some of the rock was then transformed into the blocks that built the pyramid. Sphinxes and lions were both symbols of the sun, a powerful part of ancient Egyptian religion. There is some evidence that this was part of a larger temple complex, but so far, not a lot has been discovered. The last and smallest pyramid is the Pyramid of Menkare. He was the son of Khafre and therefore the grandson of Khufu. The inside of the pyramid is complicated with turning paths and several niches for statues. It's important to note that the pyramid and the surrounding complex was not finished by the time of Menkare's death but that doesn't mean it wasn't filled with amazing statues. These have allowed us to understand Old Kingdom portraiture and artistic conventions. This brings us right to the final image of this video, a nearly life-size statue of Pharaoh Menkare and his queen. Created between 2490 and 2472 BCE, the pair reflect the power and beauty of the Egyptian monarchy. Both stand tall and straight. Their relationship is indicated by the queen's arm wrapped lovingly around Menkare's waist. Their bodies are in perfect proportion, an idealized view of royalty, unlike the seated scribe from earlier in this video. However, there is a sense of individuality with the facial features. This balance between realism and idealism is fascinating, especially because this piece is thousands of years old. These images are just the first half of the required images for ancient Egypt in APR history. However, there are still several more, and they throw some surprising curveballs into our knowledge of the time period. Make sure to keep an eye out for Ancient Egypt Part 2.